I'm Jennifer Tuttle. I am the Dorothy M. Healy Chair in Literature and Health. So I direct the Maine Women Writers Collection here at UNE, and I teach in the English department, and I teach courses on literature and health on the Biddeford campus. I used to teach up here too, but you know, that's in the past now, which is very sad. Um, so uh, we're really, really happy to be hosting today's IPEC Lunch and Library event. And uh, what I wanted to do was just briefly tell you who we are, and then I'm gonna turn things over to our curator, Kathleen Miller. So the Maine Women Writers Collection is a special collection of items and materials within the library here on campus. We have a special facility that is state of the art, uh, which we need because the Women Writers Collection holds rare and unique material related to women writing in Maine. And just so you know, we are available for you anytime. All you have to do is check in, make an appointment, just make sure we're open. And, and anyone, student at UNE, faculty, staff, or community member is welcome to come and enjoy the material research or for research or just for fun. Um, today what we want to do is share with you some really, really special material and our curator, Kathleen Miller, has prepared some, what I hope will be very thought-provoking and um, exciting questions for you that might give you an opportunity to do some introspection about uh, the encounter between medical professional and patient slash client. So, um, I think without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathleen Miller, and she's gonna share with you a little bit more about the specific activity that you're gonna be doing today. One last thing I'll just say is that you will, may have noticed that there are two tables in the room that have original artists' books on them. We're gonna talk about what those are a little bit later. Uh, there will be time later on for you to handle those and look at those. And if you don't have a chance to do that today, if you have to leave early uh, for another commitment, you can come to the collection and look at them. So they are available to you, okay? So here's Kathleen Miller, the curator of the Maine Women Writers Collection. <laughs> I'm just gonna use this one. Um, Thanks for being here today. It's a great turnout, and I'm really excited to share these materials with you. Um, I will say that there may be some emotions that come up for you during this event. Um, that's part of the design, because part of what we're going to be talking about today is empathy and um, how to connect story and connect in the room with a client, with a patient. So if things come up for you, just sit with it. Just, you know, you'll have a chance to talk with each other as well. So um, it should be also enjoyable and you'll have a chance to look at the materials that are on your table and interact with them. Um, <clears throat> I stand here not only as the curator of the Maine Women Writers Collection, but I stand here as someone who lives with chronic illness every day. Um, and while I look very healthy and no one would necessarily know that that is part of my experience, um, you know, that's something that I walk around with. And so for me, this is a personal, this is a bit of a personal topic as well. And I think that's important to note that, you know, there may be many of us in this room that have that experience. And so thinking about what we bring to the room is um, an important part of what we're gonna do today. So, um, so this, is a, this is a statement from one of the artists, the artists who we're gonna talk about today, Martha Hall. Um, so if you can imagine someone calling you on the phone, someone you don't know, giving you bad news, and then that's it, the end and you're left with that experience. Um, and so narrative 
story comes up in a lot of ways. Martha used her artist sensibilities to create meaning out of her experience. She worked with the feelings that came up for her. She um, talked about what it meant to live with cancer. And all of these books that are here have that narrative as part of, um, as part of the books. What does illness do to a person's life? There's the physical experience of having a body that's different than the body you thought you had before. There's an interruption. Um, one day you were healthy, maybe, and then the next day your whole life is completely different. Understanding this experience is an important thing for those of you who will be working directly with patients, with clients. I think it's, it's a really important piece to understand so that when you sit with someone, or whatever role you have, you're bringing that knowledge that it, whatever you're saying to them is impactful and can really have waves that you don't even necessarily know. So narrative allows us to knit together pieces of our story. It allows us to bring meaning from something that might otherwise feel meaningless, um, might feel like your whole life is blown apart. How do you recreate a story? So narrative is a really useful tool and not one that I think we, you know, I think we think about science as this, like, here's what we do. We do these tests, we do, you know, we have certain ways of understanding. And, but then there's this human component. Like, what, what do we do when we sit with each other at a table at lunch? You tell stories, right? You talk to each other about your day, you talk about your lives, you maybe talk about things that you fear, things that worry you, that test that you think you might fail, whatever it is, you're, you're talking about your life and you're connecting in that way. So having and making space in the provider-client relationship um, for narrative to be there opens a space that allows healing to happen. Whether or not you do anything or not, just being open and being aware and being present is a really powerful tool. Um. <clears throat> So, and it opens the doorway for empathy. So what is empathy? Empathy is an understanding of how a disease and its treatment are likely to affect how patients actually live. Understanding what a disease means to a patient can certainly result in an emotional response. But empathy is an understanding based on reasonably complete knowledge of who the patient is. Empathic understanding is a basic characteristic of, a, of the true clinician and a fundamental requirement for the full development of practical clinical knowledge. Um, and I list the sources on these slides. There is a Google Doc that is, um, there are a few sources on your tables, um, a few sheets with the um, bibliography, but there's also a Google Doc that is linked to the event um, page for this talk, and you can link to that, and anybody at UNE, with a UNE email address can access that. Um, again, this is an email from Martha Hall to a friend of hers. And this is about her life. This is a day-to-day -day experience. We took Danielle to Logan on Saturday, then had Gabrielle here on Sunday. Those are her two daughters. And of course, chemo today. I have shingles and brown tail moth rash, so feel edgy and itchy. All my misery is exacerbated by the heat, my low white cell count, 1.2, and chemo, although maybe these last two are one and the same. The medicine for the shingles 
makes me feel sick, fluey, and longing for sleep. In this email, she goes on to talk about the rest of her life, which is about making books, about making art. She's more of a person than just her body and her experience of illness. But, you know, this may be the only thing that you as a provider would see. Um, so, one of the things in these narratives, um, and, and it's an underlying thing that probably isn't ever fully spoken out loud, um, but it's the fear of death. It's when your body stops doing what you know that it should do and it stops working the way you think it should work, what happens? There's, there's a fear that emerges whether you realize that the depth of that fear or not. Um, as a person who ha lives with a disease, you sort of begin to see your life in a different way. You don't, you don't know how long you have to live necessarily. Um, and so as a provider, allowing that fear of death to be a presence in the room to, to name it, to um, share with a patient, you know, I understand this might be really scary, to just take a moment to have that kind of empathy um, can provide a lot of room for things to settle. Um, there's a really wonderful TED Talk that I recommend and is on the sheet um, that's by Rita Sharon, who heads the Columbia University Narrative Medicine Program. And she talks about how she has a patient who shows up, she's had a, a lumpectomy, had a recurrence, and then had a mastectomy, and she's just got all this anxiety. She thinks everything she feels in her breast, she feels like this isn't right, something's going wrong, I'm going to die, you know. But she doesn't ever say, I'm going to die. She's like freaking out. She comes in every week. And at one point in the interaction, Dr. Sharon says, I think what's happening is that, you know, we're, we're sitting with the fear of your own mortality. And then like, you know, they have a conversation. There's room. <clears throat> excuse me, there's room between them to talk about that and then things shift for this patient because she was heard and that fear, that unnamed fear is named and is given a little bit of space. So a lot of, a lot of the books that you're going to see really do that. They work with that fear of death. They work with like, what, what do I have left? Um, and this quote really gets at that. You know, what is our identity after illness? And I'll read this for those of you who are far away. The pressure is on from doctors and loved ones to do something right away. Kill it, get it out now. The endless exams, the bone scan to check for the metastases, the high-tech heart test to see if I'm strong enough to withstand chemotherapy, all these blur the line between selfhood and thinghood anyway. As my cancer career unfolds, I will, the helpful pamphlets explain, become a composite of the living and the dead, an implant to replace the breast, a wig to replace the hair, and then what will I mean when I use the word I? Um, this quote, I think, really acknowledges the fact that a lot of times what people really need when they walk in the room is they just need to be heard and they need to be seen. They need to have a sense that people will, people will understand where they're coming from. 
I think that can be achieved in a pretty simple way. You know, often um, providers, you know, there's a lot of information to type in. There's a lot of, there's a lot to know. There are a lot of questions to ask. But I think stopping, if you're like typing something, stopping, making eye contact with somebody, sitting with them for like a minute and listening is enough to really connect so that people feel like they're actually being heard by you. Um, and I like this last part of this quote, empathy opens our eyes to let us see what the CT scan has missed. So there are tests that show you a lot of things, but there are also stories that tell you other things. Um, I've been reading a lot in the news lately about people, you know, people dying of cancer, people being diagnosed with cancer. This is Lori Beckland died at the beginning of February. She was an award-winning reporter. She was, um, you know, she had won tons of prizes. She's this amazing investigative journalist. And part of her narrative was, who will even remember the Lori? You know, who will, who will even want to publish my next book? Who will give me a book contract when they learn that I'm, I have metastatic cancer in four places in my body? Um, so her experience of going through all of these tests and failing is a big part of the narrative. She becomes another number another person who died, and where is her story? So this is where we get into the doing part. Um, so imagine you, however old you are, you go to the doctor for a routine test, and you find out that you have metastatic cancer. You have a short period of time to live. What? Do you feel and what comes up for you as you sit with that right now? And I realize this is a lot to ask for you to sit with this right now. Does anyone want to say anything that comes up for them? You can shout it out. What? Free. Free? <laughs> Free. I think all of those are things that, well, maybe for a few days, <laughs> worry about. I mean, that's not something about the time or, you know, that long stretch in the drive. I can say whatever I want to whoever I want, and then, you know, off to the side. That's a very good perspective. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> Does anyone have any more um, uncomfortable responses? <laughs> <laughs> um, so like at this point you probably can see the trend um, you can see that the trend has increased but you know it can be like okay well I'm not so I don't have a life insurance policy so how does my family afford sorry thanks That's how does I'm my saying. family afford the funeral or like my student loans if something happened right now like honestly that'd be almost $300,000 just here given to somebody yeah. that's not me so that's yeah, that's powerful. I would want to make sure to have those like really hard conversations with my family and loved ones about how I want the end of my life to look. So I think mm -hmm. a lot of people don't take the time to do that and they're afraid of saying out loud that I am going to die. And so everyone tiptoes around it and you don't get the chance to say to your loved ones and to your family members what really needs to be said until it's too late. Um, and making sure that everyone around you understands how you want to die and what treatments you do and do not want because those are also very mm -hmm. important conversations to have. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, huh, one more? 
Well, just shock. Shock, yeah. Shock. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So now we're going to look at a case. We're going to look at Martha Hall, who you know we've heard a little bit about. This is her case. Um, I can read it for people who can't see really well. Um, so Martha Ann Hall, born June 4th, 1949, Malden, Mass. In April 1989, she discovered a, left, a lump in her left breast. In May 1989, she was diagnosed with stage one breast cancer. In May 1989, she had a lumpectomy. In June 1989, she had a mastectomy. It was her 40th birthday. July to December 1989, she had chemotherapy. July 1993, she be, had pain in her shoulders. She had tests. Um, she was taking Tylox. She had physical therapy, was treated with steroids. In July of 1993, she was diagnosed with a recurrence metastatic breast cancer stage three. From July to December, oh, sorry, September 1993, she was hospitalized at Maine Medical Center for three rounds of high-dose chemotherapy. In October of 1993, she was to have a bone marrow transplant, but it was postponed. She ended up having the transplant in November 1993 at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital. From January 1994 to March 1994, she had six rounds of radiation to her hip and neck. In 1998, she found another lump in her neck. She had a biopsy. In July of 1998, she was diagnosed with a recurrence, stage four metastatic breast cancer. In July of 1998, she was having radiation twice a day for two weeks, skipped a week, and then repeated four times. In spring of 1999, she began having pain in her ribs. In summer of 1999, the pain became very intense. In September of 1999, she was diagnosed with cancer in her hips, spine, skull, ribs, and liver. She began weekly chemotherapy in September of 1999, and she retired due to illness in 2000. So I just want you to reflect on this case um, yourself and think about what what you feel about it, what you think about it, what you know, what you feel you could offer as a provider. What you know, what if anything comes up for you? It could be your own feelings or your own response to something that happened in your own life. And that's one thing I did want to bring up that I, I think I forgot to mention is um, the idea that we bring, we bring a lot of things into the room with us when we meet other people's experience. Um, so there is a really interesting exercise I read about in my research, which was uh, Rita Sharon again. She had her students do parallel charts so they had a chart for the patient, and then they had a chart that they wrote their own, their, their responses to that person, their feelings, their thoughts, their biases, their judgments, whatever, so that they had a record of their experience of that person, and they could see it clearly. And I think it's important to note what we carry around with us when we deal with people, because we might m be making judgments that we don't even realize. Um, so, I'm going to play a clip from the film. Jennifer's going to introduce it. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to quickly say, um, I just want to take a quick poll. So, when Kathleen um, asked you to imagine, to inhabit the patient experience and to imagine that you had just gotten that diagnosis before, 
honest show of hands, how many of you thought to yourself, I don't want to think about that. I don't actually want to think about that. <laughs> I'm just, I, you know, no judgment here. This is really a totally reasonable response. And so I just wanted to ask that because sometimes I think it's worth, you know, acknowledging that would really suck, right? I mean, that would really be, and, and I don't, and so, you know, as the, as the caregiver or the health professional, you know, it's, it's, if we're thinking about the parallel chart idea, it's worth just being conscious. You, you know, you don't have, no judgment, but just being aware of your own, uh, you know, what, as she says, what you bring with you into the room. It's just worth acknowledging that because I think it helps us move forward, right? Okay, so a quick word. When I, I came to UNE in 2001, and when I arrived, the former curator of the collection, Callie Gurley, who's here with us today and, and uh, um, is now the director of special collections, she was you know, already on the case of Martha, and she was aware of Martha's amazing artwork and said, you know, please take a look at these. I really feel like we should get these for the collection. Uh, and we knew that there was a, a real focus, cur curriculum-wise, on health issues and medicine. And so we decided to focus our acquisitions of Martha's books, she, because she made tons of wonderful, beautiful things, uh, specifically on, on issues of her experience as a patient, because we knew that this would be valuable educationally to students. Um, Martha also expressed great interest in that and was very, very excited about the idea. Uh, and then we realized, we don't have a lot of time. This was 2001, and you know, you know about the case, which you just heard about. Uh, and so we decided to go to Martha's house in, on Orr's Island in Maine and interview her. And so we developed some questions. We went to her house uh, with some wonderful folks here from UNE, um, and we recorded the interview, and then from that, a film was made um, documenting some things about Martha Hall and, and her case uh, as she understands it and experiences it. So this clip uh, Kathleen will share with you and while, while you're watching this, I'd like you to think about, you just saw the dry list of facts about her case. Now I'd like you to think about how does hearing Martha tell some of her story, change your response to her case, or add to it, modify it, whatever, color it. Uh, how does it change your response to her as a person? And did anything surprise you? So just think about those things and anything else that is interesting to you while you watch this short clip, okay? Directly when they're holding it in their hand, but my words are coming off the page. I can't put more weight of importance on one audience, if you will, than another. But I put a huge amount of importance on using the books to communicate with my physicians and my nurses and the medical community in general. Thursday night at an art show opening, I stood in the gallery with two other artists. We talked about our tattoos, blue dots to mark radiation's burn. Reminders that make us sad, angry, frightened, grateful to be alive. I have blue dots on my hip, one now even on my chin. There are three in a row above the scar on my blank left chest. One of the women pulled down the neckline of her dress to show us a blue dot centered between her breasts, now gone. We compared our tattoos, standing there in the art gallery among the guests, as if this were an ordinary thing to do. I took this book to several of my physicians, and because I am living with cancer today and being treated today, which is 12 years, um, 12 years since the original diagnosis. I have a lot of doctors. But I took it to my radiation oncologist 
And as he was looking at the book, he had two responses. And one was, oh, you could be an artist. I was thinking, well, that's great. You know, I'm like, what am I? Um, that was one response. Um, and the other response was, what do you mean radiations burn? in a span of, well, it says July 7th through 16th. So in that span of time, I talked to five different doctors. Um, I was speaking with them because I had just received a diagnosis, a very unexpected diagnosis of a second recurrence. So this is after my bone marrow transplant it's, um, that I was caught by surprise. And I, I um, did each of the each of the voices of the five doctors in a different font. It will be slow to go away. It was slow to grow. You won't know if a Remedex is working. We'll be working in the dark. I felt it two months ago. I didn't want to believe you'd failed. The bone marrow transplant failed. You are responsive to chemo. We failed. You failed. It's the last thing I want to hear is I failed. And he was using it in a very medical terminology sense. It meant that treatment failed for you. But it came across as I as a person failed, he as a physician failed. And it wasn't until we had a chance to really talk about that that it softened it somewhat for me, but for a long time that I failed, we failed has been a pain. He was the one who had not seen this book. And he would, I'd bring it in from time to time and he'd say, I don't have time. Um, I, I don't have this, I don't have that. So there was one day when, when he came in and I said, I'm going to be giving a talk in my books. And somebody's going to ask me, because they always do, have all the doctors seen this book? And I'm going to say, no. The one who was most black and white and the one I was most angry at has not seen it. And so I still have this anger because you won't look at it. And I said, I'm going to tell them that you haven't looked at it. He said, all right, all right, I will look at it. So he's sitting in his chair, and I'm sitting in mine, and we're way too far apart. He's on that side of the little room, and I'm on this side of the little room. And I said, if you're going to look at it, let's move your chair, or I'll move my chair, and you're going to sit next to me, and we're going to look at it. And we did. Do you want to speak to me on the phone or in person? When I sat down with him, and we read this page, and I said, that's you. That's what you said to me. And he goes, yeah, kind of so. I mean, he didn't say so, but you know, had that kind of reaction. And my response was, it was so important to me to see you in person. And he said, you don't understand. Most people don't want to see me in person. That it's too hard to have that kind of difficult emotional time with this person who's somewhat of a stranger. And he said, it's very unusual for somebody to want to talk to me in person. In contrast, I have um, a doctor that was my physician during my bone marrow transplant. And because she is in Vermont practicing now, I only see her usually a couple times a year. But I will say she's also the only physician that's been to my house and had dinner. And uh, I think we have a very special relationship she tells me the same things as the physician I see every week. And I always call him my partner, and I feel like he is my partner, and I'm so glad I have him. He is a scientist. He is extraordinarily um, intelligent and caring and distant, black and white. And she's not black and white. And when she tells me the same news, no matter how difficult it is, she tells it in a way that I can bring it into my heart and live with it.
She said to me, this is not about if, this is about when. And what she's talking about is, this is not about if you have another recurrence after this, it's about when. It could be six months, it could be six years. And probably the most important thing anybody has ever said to me, in order to live, you must live with the fear of dying. And then, there's a little, little book in here that I've given kind of a separate name to of legacy because that day she said to me, your books will be your legacy for family and for friends. And if you live to be an old lady, we'll reminisce. Okay, so think about that for a second. It's, um, it's a really moving film. I, I'm, I can tell from some of your expressions that you, you felt that too. Um, does anyone feel ready to share your response? What was it like to hear from Martha? after just having the dry details of her case before that? That's a great question. Wow. So, if you've known someone, did the things that Martha said ring true to you? Did they reinforce things that you know? Yeah. How do you think, you know, because all of you are scientists in one way or another, right? Um, with one expertise or another. And so you will encounter, you will, you know, get acquired data and information about your patients in a variety of forms. Um, but what do you think Martha's, what seemed to you to be Martha's point or Mar what was Martha's concern about making sure that that last doctor read her book? Why was that so important to her, do you think? You know I'm going to come up to someone and hand them the microphone, right? There's no right answer, or no wrong answer. But what do you think, what's, what did you take to be her, um, her concern? Because did you detect that she was kind of getting pretty angry? Right? So, I think she wanted a universal understanding from all the people that she was dealing with because she felt like if he hadn't read the book, then she wouldn't be like fully understood. And so if, so reading the book that she wrote, right, was, was his way of showing that he had listened to her. So isn't it interesting that a conversation in the office was she didn't feel was enough, right? And maybe it's because he was the, the, the doctor who would really, you know, mastered what I think often is a survival skill of detachment, right? But she shows us just how much her anger can get in the way, her anger at him for that. She, she experiences that as him not listening to her and not understanding her story. What else? Is there anything else people want to share about that? I know this film does require a lot of quiet thinking <laughs> before you actually know what you want to say, but does anyone else have a sense that what does a film add? What does hearing from Martha add to the dry list of facts? I got, I got, yes. I have a comment. 
Um, seems like she just wanted the doctor to acknowledge her as a person and not just a bunch of tests and results and treatments. You know, she actually had feelings and, you know, she wanted the, the doctor to just consider her as a person. Okay. Okay. Going back to this idea of being heard, yeah. right? Um, and do you have something to add? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say I thought it was interesting that she, so the, the medical chart, right, was the doctor's narrative on her. Um, and so I think it was really imperative for her to say, this is my narrative on my experience. Yeah. This is what was going on when you were writing yeah. that. So. And if I could just throw in something totally randomly personal that connects with that. Um, when I was pregnant, I started off with an OB and then I switched to a midwife. And when I went to the midwife's office for my first appointment, I checked in and then they handed me my chart. And they're like, okay, go weigh yourself, record it, go check your blood pressure, record it, pee on a stick, record it. And, and, and I was like, you mean I get to read this? Right? And there's this sense that um, I think when you're a patient, right, you get the sense that <laughs> the, the, the medical professional's narrative of your case is the authoritative one, and you don't have a say in that. You don't even get to know what it is. Um, and and this, so this goes back to, right, the fact of, you know, owning, having the authority over your own experience. One of the questions that Kathleen was, got, was guiding your, your opening remarks was, um, what happens, what would happen if providers approach patients as experts in their own life? So it's just worth thinking about that, right? Okay, so I, I mean, there's more we could say, but let's move on to the next thing, and I'm going to let you take the transition from here. So um, in the middle of all of your tables, and I'm sorry to the people who are sitting on the side, um, on the middle of the tables there are some sheets with printed out pages from various artist books. Um, so what I want you to do is sit together as a group, look at those, have a conversation as a team in your, at your table, and you know discuss all of the things that you've learned so far. Um, think about your experience listening and seeing the film talk, but imagine that Martha is sitting with you telling you these stories that are on the pages. And imagine how that impacts your experience of her, of yourself as a provider. Um, how does that impact your plan of action? And those of you who are on the sides, we do have the books set up on the tables, and you're welcome to come up and look at those. Um, I would ask that people don't bring food or drink up to those tables. Those of you who are sitting at these tables, you'll have a chance a little bit later on to look at those. Um, so begin. <laughs> And we'll this come will be check a, on you in a few yeah, minutes. Yeah, we'll have a few minutes to do this, you know, have some conversation with each other. This is hopefully a good team building activity. Build some. We know that some of you do have to go, and if you're in that category, thank you for coming, and don't forget that you can come to the collection inside the library to see Martha's books for yourself. So I'm just going to randomly um, ask those, all of you in the table at the very back, what, what do you, anyone want to kind of share, is there something that's sort of the gist of your conversation? Um, I know you swirled around a lot of topics, but... Um, are there any questions from the ones that are up projected on the screen that you feel like you kind of formulated an answer to? And yeah, please speak into the handheld mic and then we'll get it. Um, oh, sorry, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we, wow. 
That was loud. Yeah. Um, we talked mainly about how we feel like it's kind of common sense. And we thought that that one doctor was just a jerk. <laughs> and our conversation just mainly was like, we would never do that. So we can't even understand. And we also, I mean, I felt when watching that that they focused more on the doctor who was rude to her than the doctor that she was very friendly with and came to her house for dinner. And I wish that like not all patients are alike and not all doctors are alike either. That's so right. that's kind of what we focused on. That's an interesting point. And uh, what I don't know what, what materials each table got, but each table got different materials. Was there anything from the material, the photocopies of her books that are on your table that sparked any responses or discussion? Or was it, was it mostly the film, which is fine, but... It was mostly the film. Yeah. Our pictures are the ones that were in the PowerPoint for the most part, so... Okay. We saw them before. Okay. Very interesting. Um, yeah, please. Your turn. Um, I just wanted to, to, to say, um, when I was reading through a lot of, uh, lots and lots of different people's narratives about illness, one of the things that was really shocking to me was over and over and over, there was some doctor who was completely unempathetic and completely like, you know, just you are a piece of paper with a test result. Like, so I totally understand what you're saying, but it's also really interesting to see how common that narrative is that like there's somebody who really just doesn't know how to listen. So, all right, now just randomly, what about you guys? Not the first table, but the one, the next one over. Can someone kind of summarize your favorite point from your discussion? Tori really wanted to talk, but uh, I convinced her not to. Um, yeah, first of all, we were wondering um, what radiation doctor doesn't know that radiation burns. Like, who, like, how do you, how are you an expert in your field and just not understand, like, common side effects of treatment. Um, and the second thing was, yeah, I think that it was, there are a lot of different patients out there. Um, I know there's a lot of different doctors and um, luckily there are specialties to, you know, put doctors into like surgery so they don't ever have to interact with patients <laughs> on like a certain level. But um, some patients might, you know, doctor says, hey, come sit close to me, let me, you know, I really feel bad about that. They might think that that's, you know, being yeah, you know, you're just being fake, or you, you might, it might come off the wrong way to some people. Um, and so we were kind of perplexed with how do you figure that out in a 25-minute visit with a patient, you know, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. We don't know. That's a really good point, and I know a lot of, um, you know, a lot of your curricula and a lot of the IPAC events you know, uh, raise questions about cultural competency, right? And sort of understanding, you have, there's so much to understand, right? About each individual patient and their cultural context. And then of course there's the whole, their biographical experience and you're right. I think it's um, a very delicate line to walk, right? Uh, how will one patient versus another interpret your actions? And, and it's not one size fits all either, right? just to make things more complicated. Okay, is there another table next? I'm gonna try if we have time to get to everybody. Is there someone wants to, next to share? Because you know I'm gonna swoop in with the microphone again. <laughs> oh no, I don't have it. Ah, okay. Excellent, thank they you. They were having a really interesting conversation. <laughs> so we had one paper that said when I, first, when I first started taking Tylox, I lived alone in, my, in an apartment in New York City. I had to take so many for the pain that I worried I wouldn't wake up and no one would find me. We agree? You know, I mean, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. I would be, it, it, you feel bad for somebody in this position because they're already experiencing enough pain as it is from their condition, but then to have you know, that pain compounded with worry. You know, it's, it's humbling for me to read something like this, try, feeling like, uh, you know, pretty inadequate as a provider. I wouldn't, I would feel overwhelmed in trying to deal with the multiple needs that somebody in this position has. Anybody else? 
We also talked about marijuana for Excellent. about 10 minutes over here. Full disclosure. <laughs> yeah, there's another paper about you know, uh, nausea being such a common side effect from the condition and from the treatment. And we were talking about the dispensaries throughout Maine for medical marijuana. So, I don't know if anybody else wants to talk about that. <laughs> That's fascinating though, you know, what you say. And I think, again, this goes back to that parallel chart, right? And I imagine that one feeling, that especially if one is inclined the way many of you seem to be, to be sensitive to, you recognize that there's all this stuff going on in the room, right? And, and that, and, and the almost insurmountable task of uh, understanding and helping the patient through that experience, I can imagine that that feeling of, of being overwhelmed and, and out of your depth um, would be a totally valid response, <laughs> you know? I mean, obviously, one, it, once you recognize that that, that that feeling is there, then that helps you take the next step, whatever it might be, but... It's a really great, honest answer. You're, I believe that your pages came from the book called Prescriptions, which, if you haven't had a chance to look at the whole thing, it's really powerful and amazing. And I was just chatting with one of your pharmacy fac faculty who was telling me um, that she was really moved by the page that says, the pharmacist always asks me if I have any questions, and I always say no. And the whole rest of the book is about her questions and fears about her prescriptions. What do you do with that, right? Another overwhelming task. Okay, another table. Who's next? All right, I'm gonna swoop down. <laughs> um, we have one page that just says, I'm sorry a million times in um, all the different fonts of the different doctors that she was talking about. We found that really interesting because how helpful is it to hear I'm sorry over and over again? You really need the empathy to, to connect with your patient and help them, I guess. And isn't it interesting that that book contained all, all of the doctors, including the one whom she felt was so black and white, right? But even he said I'm sorry, right? Interesting. Okay. Who next? Um, so ours was a little heated in that we kind of feel like this is a big thing for any provider to get on or, you know, to take on. And nobody wants to give that diagnosis to somebody. Nobody wants to give them the worst news and the family, the worst news they're ever gonna have. So this doctor delivers, or delivers this news to this lady, you're automatically not gonna like that doctor. I've never liked any of my family members who had cancer doctor that gave them that news and it's a lot to take on. So I think it's harsh looking at the providers that way. Um, and I think he was trying to give empathy to her maybe in the only way he could. And um, what else were we talking about? It just, it, and for us, we would never treat a patient like she was describing. And you don't necessarily have to go have dinner with a patient to be a good provider, I feel like. It's just sitting down and listening to them. As Brent said, it's a 25 minute appointment. So it's trying to educate everything we can on this life changing event in 25 minutes. And so it's, it's a lot to put on us saying that you're not a good provider for not going and having dinner with this person. And isn't it interesting, right, that yeah, just because you didn't have enough on your plate, you also have to deal with the patient's expectations and judgments of you, right? There's that too. That's in the room. Right, and maybe had the patient um, from the front been like, here's what I need from you, or like, I mean, I, I don't know. Once he sat down and got the book and listened, mm -hmm. she was fine. Mm -hmm. And so, I was gonna, yeah. I was gonna say, sometimes when you tell a patient that news, they kind of like shut down. So after that, the doctor could have been really empathetic and could have been like, I understand this is hard, 
But in her head, she probably just blocked everything out, which is a lot of hard. Because if you talk to people who have been through like a lot of trauma or a big experience, they're like, no one was there to help me, no one was there to help me. But there are like a bunch of people around that were actually helping, but they just can't see it in that moment. That's a great point. We have another, oh, two microphones. I think it's important to realize too that the doctor-patient relationship is a two-way street. So it's not just the doctor relating to the patient. Mm -hmm. The patient needs to take the responsibility to also relate to the doctor. And I know that a lot of people don't necessarily know the right questions to ask or how to relay their feelings. And that's why I think it's really important for any provider to say and not, you know, briskly at the end of an encounter. Do you have any questions? Okay, great, no, like, see you later. But actually, like, let there be silence. Don't be afraid of the silence in the room, you know? Like, if you need to give someone a minute to absorb what they're being told, take that time. Ha let's say, let's, let's have a break. Like, let you absorb this. But I think it's very important for any provider to encourage their patient to talk about how they're feeling and ask the questions that they have because they cannot read the patient's mind. And I thought it was very interesting in the video how Martha was saying all of these emotions and feelings that she was having about the doctor, and she never said that to him. And he doesn't know that she feels that way unless she says that to him. So I think both parties need to take some responsibility for the communication. I like your point about, too, about sort of thinking about giving that opening to the patient. It's also worth thinking about, too, right? Like. Um, that encounter is different from many others in the sense that there's a real difference in real or perceived power, right? Especially, you know, when you're sitting there in, in a little Johnny, right? Or a paper dress or whatever, or you're, you're like, you know, you're not even fully clothed. Do you know what I mean? Like when you're in that, when you're in the examination room, for example, um, you don't feel empowered necessarily to, it, it's just, I think it's a very, uh, there's a lot of vulnerability, right? And so it's interesting, right, if you, because if you, you're, you're absolutely right that one thing that I think a lot of wonderful practitioners do is they try to empower their patients to be more involved and, um, and own the experience and whatever. But, but I think also, like you say, um, it's, it's not always easy. Yes. I think another thing that's important is asking open-ended questions instead of just saying, for example, the, she said how um, the physician, I mean the pharmacist asked if she had any questions about her medication. It's easy to say no. Instead, she could have worded it and said, what are your questions about your medications? Instead of, so then you can't just say no. It's, it m provokes more conversation. Good point. Can I say something too, just quickly? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say too, you know, part of what we're talking about in terms of the relationship is that, me, you know, many of the things we're discussing have to deal with not just the moment of giving bad news to someone, but the ongoing relationship that if someone's living with a chronic illness, they're dealing with doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor nurses and blood draws and all these things so how do you how do you maintain a relationship not just like in that moment of dropping the big news have we heard from you guys yet no. <laughs> we'd love to anyone want to share <laughs> um, our conversation was kind of a lot like uh, Brittany's table over in the back um, I think there's two sides of every story, like what she mentioned in her video about, um, you know, the doc. she called the doctor out and said, you know, like, do you want to speak to me in person or do you want to call me? And he was like, well, I'm sorry, but most of my potions, patients don't want to see me. So it, it's kind of hard to find that balance and just kind of know what that person wants in a 25 minute visit. It's, I, don't, I don't think there's any perfect way to do it, but. One question that was raised with one group, and I'm, I'd love to know what anyone thinks about this, was uh, what if you had been that black and white doctor, or, or any of the others for that matter, what, what would be your response if a patient 
put you in a book and brought that book in to show you, how would that feel to you? Maybe you could think about what you'd say or do, but also just how would you, what would that experience feel like? I'd be fine with it. I think you gotta, <laughs> it's our job. I mean, we're doing a job. We're not, I, you gotta be able to take the heat if that's how she's allowed to come to closure for it. Like, if that makes it easier for her, that's my job, it's fine. That's what I think, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're thinking now. Um, also, like with a case like this, it's not easy for one person to handle, and there are a lot of resources. If this physician doesn't think he can be empathetic and give this woman the support she needs, there's gr support groups, there are nurses who specialize in, you know, support for patients like this. I mean, some people have great supportive families that can help, but if you don't, there are places to reach out and refer to if a physician doesn't think they have the time or the empathy or the effort or even the heart to do it. So I think someone should, I, I'm not a big fan of this physician in general, but if he doesn't think he's capable, he, there should be people he can refer her to because this is a rough situation for most, I think. I forgot what the question was, but <laughs> I, there was the talk about going to dinner at the patient's house and all that. And I think if you become really close, especially in that field with every single patient, you're becoming close with so many people that are going to die. And that can really shut you down. So, I don't know, that could just be really tough on somebody. And some of these, uh, you have a doctor who's been doing this for so long, and they may just not be able to handle that anymore, and they may close off. And to looking in on that, it could just be that they're cold, but maybe they've just been doing it too long, or it's just tough to handle, or it's kind of a defense mechanism on their part. I don't know exactly what I want to say here, but I know I have something to say, so I'm just going to start talking. Um, so um, so I'm, I'm 51, and I'm going through PA school, and maybe it's because of going through it at this age. I don't know. My previous career was as a counselor, and so I've had the luxury, if you will, of sitting with people for 50-minute, hour-and-a-half long stretches and um, really exploring their um, depths. Um, and their feelings, and um, I guess I just want to say something about something that's uh, happened for me over the last nine months of being in PA school with these 50 or so uh, younger people, um, that I've developed this immense empathy for uh, practitioners. Um, it's indescribable what this process is. It's very nearly obliterating um, in terms of its, am I wrong? In terms of its, um, <laughs> in terms of its difficulty, it's, it's, um, it's really amazing. And it, it is, tr I mean, I, I'm a very articulate person. I do uh, over and over find it impossible to describe to people, even those close to me, what this is like. Um, so yeah, I, I hear the story about this, you know, this bad doctor, but I, also now have this sense of um, empathy uh, for possibly what the pressures are on that person to, um, to you know, to deal with uh, the stuff that you're dealing with at what I imagine is a, an unrelenting pace. Um, so. so something also I thought was interesting after going through this, I'll go back and um, my grandfather before he passed had so many chronic conditions, it's ridiculous, like I wouldn't want to touch him with a 10 foot pole. And my grandma hates doctors and hates any practitioner because of this experience she had with him in that you couldn't do, you couldn't treat one thing without leading it to another thing. And so when you have a chronic illness or you have something like that, it's really hard to manage and so you never feel 100% almost and the doctor can be working their tail off for you and you don't understand maybe how hard it is to manage and get you to feel 100% again. And so I think that's something that it's hard to see unless you've been on the other side of, maybe this doctor loses sleep every night because he can't make this woman feel as good as she used to feel, but it's never gonna happen. And maybe that's the type of conversation he needs to have with her. <laughs> I 
Uh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add to what Amber had to say. Like, um, I feel like a lot of like patients look to doctors or providers or PAs or nurse practitioners or whoever to have the answers. And the truth is, a lot of times we don't. And I think that it would do everyone a whole lot of good if we just said that out loud. You know, like you have this chronic condition and we can do X, Y, and Z, but ultimately like nothing is going to cure it. And like, I'm sorry, I'm human just like you. I don't have the answer. I can guide you through the process. I can try to make you comfortable, but I think that this idea that like providers have a, a cure for everything is just a lie. It's not true. And we need to stop, I, I don't know, we need to stop that from persisting because it's not doing anyone any good. I, there was something up on the slideshow earlier that was, I think it was a quote from Martha or another patient about how um, we need a cure now because we're dying now and so like we don't need these FDA trials and we need this now. And I totally understand that frustration, but at the end of the day, you're this provider who's dispensing medical care and you don't have that cure. Like, you know, it's a shoulder shrug. Like, I, if I had it, I would give it to you. And I think that honesty of like, I don't know, could be helpful between patients and providers. Um, I was just gonna go back to the original question of I would be upset about being in this book. And honestly, I think I would be a little frustrated because I think a lot of the context of the situation has been taken out because there's so much um, emphasis on the words alone. Uh, like there's one right here that says, uh, your bone scan is fine, your CT scan is fine. And I think she was focusing on the word fine, like fine maybe wasn't good enough for her, but as a provider, I'm not gonna say your bone scan was amazing, like off the charts, amazing, because I don't feel comfortable saying something like that. I can't provide false hope. Um, and so I think I would be frustrated in the fact that I think that em em sorry, empathy is communicated through body language, it's communicated through tone, it's communicated through a lot more than just words. So I don't think I'd wanna be in the book, to be honest. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I just wanted to say, you know, um, the framework for this event was about inhabiting the patient experience, right? It was about empathy and um, about sort of exploring what does that look like and why is that important. It was about understanding when you're inhabiting the patient experience that that is radically disruptive and that you, that there's a, it can be very helpful to be able to construct a new narrative so that you can knit your life back together in this, in its new state, right? Uh, it's about recognizing that patients have their narratives and they have their, that whatever their perceptions are, whatever their experiences are, whatever their false understanding or expectations are, they are what they are, right? Like that's it. Um, but, as, as several of you really insightfully pointed out, the other half of the equation is that the provider, that the health professional needs to be heard, right? Um, and that, that the health professional constructs a narrative to make sense of their relationship with this patient. I mean, the chart is its own narrative, but there are all kinds of other narratives going on at the same time, right? that we construct stories to make sense of things. Uh, and, that, and, that, and that parallel chart that you might construct of what your own experience is of dealing with this case or this patient or this particular encounter is just as valid and you can of course be um, much better practitioners and maybe avoid that horrible <laughs> sense of burnout if you are able to be more, if you give yourself permission to listen to your own narrative and, and be aware of what your own frustrations and experiences and feelings are about, about whatever patient you might be dealing with, right? And so it's important for the patient to be heard, but it's also important for the practitioner to be heard and to have both sides kind of validated, right? So I'm gonna turn it over to Kathleen to, to sum up. I think she has a few words to say, but I just wanted to, say how impressed I was with this group and thank you for your contributions. Kelly? Can I just say, um, I just wanted to say, um, take another look at the Voices book and look at the whole film. I don't even know if it's up on our website. It's not we can, we can work it, it has Moby sound. 
Okay. 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 Anyway, that that <laughs> if Martha you can were check it out at the library though. Yes. If Martha were here right now, she would just be sitting in the middle of the room just digging on this whole conversation that <laughs> don't take that as a uh, judgment against doctors because she really believed that that doctor was the one, the difficult one, was her partner. And that was her main point was that he was her lifeline. So she was just simply putting her experience out there and it's, it's an incredible resource to have. So um, I hope that you don't take her work as a uh, criticism um, of the medical community because it is a partnership. And, the, and the, one of the things that she said, and you'd see this in the film if you watch the whole thing, was she said, I'm so glad that UNE is acquiring my books because I really want a conversation. And I, she said, I want to hear from the students who read my books. And for a couple of years, Oh God, maybe even once, a couple of semesters, she did because my students looked at her books and wrote letters and sent them to her. And she was incredibly grateful and for we that. And those letters. So, anyway, all right. Um, and I'll just one last thing. Um, the, there's a catalog of a show that had her artist books at Smith College. and. Her doctor, one of her doctors wrote the introduction to that book, um, to the catalog. So that's an interesting perspective too, which we have and you're welcome to, it's up here if you wanna look at it. But I just wanna thank you all for being here, for being present, for diving into this topic that's not easy, um, for being willing to entertain this exercise. Um, and I hope that you gained something from the experience and the conversations that you had with each other. And um, I'll, you know, we'll be here if you have any questions or want to chat. But thank you for for being here. <laughs>